right, if you can turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and we will be looking at more of this passage than just verse 23, but this is kind of our focal passage this morning. Luke 9, verse 23. And he, that is Jesus, and he said to all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and let him take up his cross daily, and let him follow me. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would uh, open our hearts to your spirit to hear what he has to say. I ask that you would guide me and direct me, give me the words that, that I need to speak, uh, that you would help everyone that uh, hears this message uh, to focus on what you're saying to them. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. You know, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, of course, Luke and Acts goes together. Luke is like the first part, and Acts is the second part. But um, in chapter 9 of the Gospel, uh, this good news that he has in this chapter is really packed with some... Uh, theological information is very important. Uh, in fact, uh, each one of the passages, portions of Luke chapter 9, are entire sermons all by themselves. And that's what sometimes makes it difficult for us preachers because we're trying to figure out uh, not to chase this that rabbit somewhere else. Uh, but in chapter 9, uh, there are several things that happen. The first thing that happens in chapter 9 is he commissions the 12 disciples to go throughout Israel. And uh, he gives them authority over demons and over illnesses and the ability to heal people. Uh, and uh, and. We're not exactly sure how long this, um, this commission uh, lasted, how many weeks or months that this went on, or days, uh, because Israel's not real big. And, uh, and pretty much from one corner to another, uh, with Jerusalem as its center, everything is about a day's travel by, by foot. It's about a day's travel. And uh, so Jesus has commissioned them. And as a result of their obedience to, uh, to Jesus, even King Herod hears about what's going on. And Herod has a number of questions. He starts wondering whether uh, it's... Uh, John the baptizer come back from life. He can't figure that one out because he, he t took John's head. And so he has a lot of questions as to what's going on. And then the next thing that we read about in chapter 9 is the feeding of the 5,000 near Bethesda. Uh, and then uh, the two events that take place after this verse that we read are the uh, transfiguration that took place on, we believe it was Mount Hermon, and, uh, and then he's warning people who would be disciples what that means. And those, so those are the areas, and as you can see, those are pretty involved stories there. But this chapter, what it is, is a series of setups now, what do, what do I mean by setups? Well, Jesus is setting up the disciples to learn some things. 
And folks, a lot of times in our lives, we go through things that at the time they seem really bad, but it's a setup. God has set us up to learn something. And the question is whether we learn it or not. Now, my first observation uh, is that when we, like the twelve, really are walking with the Lord, people will take notice. And even Herod uh, noticed. But, but what I didn't say was he noticed for not the right reason. Now, I want to remind you of something else that goes along with this observation. You remember Jesus gave authority to the twelve. Judas Iscariot had also been given authority. Did you ever think about that? He too had authority. Well, we don't read in, about what he did with it, but he was given that authority. Now, my second observation is this. While you may have had a great experience, like the disciples, uh, it might have been an experience in, uh, in witnessing to somebody. Uh, this past week, I was, um, I'm reminded of uh, somebody was asking me about um, my early walk with the Lord, and I was uh, telling them about... Um, I can remember we used to have Tuesday night visitation at my church and we would go out and knock on doors and go into neighborhoods and invite people to church and and if the talk took that direction we would invite them to ask Christ to be their savior and uh, again this was back in the 1970s and hardly any churches do that anymore sadly but uh, I remember that there was one summer that uh, I went with a, uh, uh, a young woman that was going to a different school, and uh, the two of us found this one family just a block from the church, right down the hill from it. And we went, and uh, they had a couple of girls that were lost. And uh, the parents got mad at us because we were sharing Christ with these girls. So we learned to try to adjust the schedule. If it was if Tuesday nights the parents were going to be there, we would ask the girls, well, when can we visit you? And then we would find out and go on a different night. But it was uh, when I got to uh, college... Um, I heard after, um, after a while, I think it must have been September, October, when I came back home uh, for a visit, and the girl said that, this, that the older girl had trusted Christ as her Savior. Now, what's interesting about that is that the parents were uh, death against their children doing that. And both the parents had a church background, but it wasn't a Baptist background. And it's interesting that even though they went to church, they did not like their children asking Jesus to be their Savior. Uh, you'd have to figure that one out. But the, the, the Paul Harvey ending of the rest of the story is, is that this young woman became a missionary. And uh, I uh, was telling different stories about uh, uh, the church that I had before I went in the Air Force. And I, uh, right before I went in on active duty, uh, about, it was either four or, or six, I can't remember. I think it was, I think there were four young people that I baptized, and two of them had already been Christians, uh, and they were related. They were uh, 
there were sisters and cousins that were involved. Two of them joined the church and the other four were baptized. And one of those, one or two of those became missionaries also. So, you know, you, and I didn't discover that until, my goodness, 20 years later. So you, you just never know. If there's a preacher listening today, you don't, don't feel like that nothing's going on. You just don't know. And, and if that's the, the case in your family, you just don't know what's going on. Even when you have people that are coming up against you. Well, anyhow, I got off on that. But uh, what I was getting at was, was that with the disciples who had had this great experience preaching and going out and, and actually even casting demons out of people and healing people. As great an experience as that one, an even greater one is coming, one which God himself does, but he allows you and me to participate in. And what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the feeding of the 5,000. And that's where Jesus asked the disciples. He says, well, you have, um, uh, you, you've noticed that these people are hungry and you've brought this to my attention. You go feed them. Now, isn't that interesting how the, the Lord will put the, uh, the burden of our awareness and tell us we need to do something about it? And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish in verse 13. Uh, well, at least they knew that much, <laughs> what they had. And folks, what we have isn't very much. But when we give it to the Lord and trust him, he can do great things with what little we have. But it's at this point that Jesus asked two questions. Luke 9, verse 18. And it came to pass as he was praying alone. Now this is after he had fed the 5,000 and he, and he had gone off to pray. The disciples were with him. And he questioned them saying, Who do the crowds pronounce me? To be. Now that's the correct term. Um, I think most English versions say say, but but the word is legusin. And this word actually originates from another Greek word, and it's iro. That's the aorist, I believe. And it means to fasten together in rows kind of like when you're stringing a necklace. You know, even today, people make up stories to explain things in a way that they find believable to themselves, and, and they string a story together. Now, some are quite proficient liars, uh, and I'm not talking about those, but what I'm talking about is people that want to try to understand what they just saw or heard, and they string together some facts, some observations. They may not be exactly correct in their observation, but, but they put it together. For example, right now, some of you probably are aware that there is a big revival, and that word I put in quotes, going on in Kentucky. And the question that I would have is, do you repeat what other people say about it, or do you, as the Bereans and the men of Issachar in the Old Testament, understand what is going on? Now, I haven't been there, but I do know a certain set of facts about it. And I won't say anything more than that. But, you know, people need to be sure of their facts. 
before they start making pronouncements. And you see, that's what Jesus was doing with his disciples. What necklace that you string together about the things God is doing is important. Your story, your understanding. Is it God doing it? Or is it something else? So Jesus was wanting to find out, uh, and of course you know and I know, that he already knew what people were saying about him. But then he goes and asks them a question directly to them. And he said to them in verse 20, But who do you pronounce me to be? What's your story? What's your understanding? And Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And of course we know the rest of this story, how that uh, at Caesarea Philippi, uh, Jesus told him, he says, well, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, Peter. The Heavenly Father, through the Holy Spirit, he's the one who has revealed this to you. Peter, I want you to think about this. Peter was telling the truth to the truth. You see, it wasn't a strung together story. And, and somebody just observing from the outside, like Judas Iscariot, he might have just thought, oh great, Peter's gone off and he's bringing attention to himself and everything like that. Because you see, Judas didn't have any idea about the Holy Spirit. He wasn't really trusting the Heavenly Father. So he was just totally observing from the outside. Jesus was asking these questions because he was wanting to uh, evaluate or help the disciples to evaluate themselves. You know, there are two things going on among the churches today in, in the world, and in particular here in this country. And, and I want to mention those. The first one is called the Emerging Church. And I've got the word church in air quotes on that one. And you might say, well, what is the Emerging Church? What does that mean? Well, I will give you a short explanation of it. The, the people that are in the emerging church de-emphasize absolutes and doctrinal creeds. In other words, there's, there's no absolute understanding of certain things. Even though scripture may say it, they say, well, that's not absolute. There's a reevaluation of the place of the Christian body of believers in society. They're really not too sure what we're supposed to be doing. There's a reexamination of the Bible and its teachings. Well, can they really believe it or not? There's a reevaluation <clears throat> of the traditionally held doctrines. And when I talk about traditionally held doctrines, I'm not talking about from a Methodist or a Baptist or Catholic perspective. I'm talking about what Christians have held to for 2,000 years. And then there's a reevaluation of the place of Christianity in the world. So that's what the emerging church is about. And that's not of God. There's another thing that's 
I don't know. I don't know if this is really a second thing or if this is a part of the emerging church, but it's called deconstructionism. I've <clears throat> heard it on um, referred to on uh, Christian radio uh, several times here lately, and so I looked into that. Deconstructionism is the refusal to recognize as authorities those perceived as occupying privileged Christian institutional positions who supposedly speak for God. Now I know that's kind of wordy, but that's what I found. And there's one man by the name of Hubner who is a deconstructionist and he says that it means uh, a critical dismantling well I'm not sure if Hubner is a deconstructionist or not but he talks about it and he says it, uh, deconstructionism is a critical dismantling of evangelical beliefs that experience education and scientific discoveries have rendered obsolete or harmful. I, from what I was reading, I think he did believe in deconstructionism because it seemed like that there were things that he said that, that evangelicals believe are harmful. And, and uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but here recently, the FBI field office in Richmond, Virginia had put uh, a particular group of Roman Catholics as terrorists. Be and the reason was they put them as that is because they only had the Mass in Latin. Now I can remember when I was going to college in Richmond I remember um, one of the fellows that uh, while well, I was studying to be a, a preacher and he was studying to be an Episcopal priest and, and he took me a couple of places uh, and talked about uh, the, the, the folks that wanted to have a Latin Mass. Now that's over 50 years ago. And you know, I've never ever heard any Roman Catholic that was part of a terrorist organization because they, they believed in having the Mass in Latin. Never heard of it, anything like that happening. And yet the FBI in Richmond has sent out uh, memos to that effect. Interesting, isn't it? So I think what Jesus was doing that day with his disciples is he was wanting to um, see that uh, what the disciples were hearing the crowd say. Because you see, the crowds were reevaluating everything that they had been taught and what they had read, and and uh, and I think what Jesus was doing was he was wanting to see, are you guys being affected by the crowds? And that's a question I would ask people this morning: Are you being affected by people who are not believers, by the FBI, the CIA? Are you being affected by uh, the deconstructionist or the emerging church? Are people deconstructing the truth? Now, somebody's going to say, now preacher, how does this relate to that passage in verse 23 that we started out about? about following Christ. Well, you know, I'm glad you asked that question. Because, you see, in the context of chapter 9, Jesus is letting the twelve, and that word let's very important there, he's letting the twelve, including Judas Iscariot, know what a disciple must do. Now, while great power is available to a follower, what Jesus is saying is you have to deconstruct yourself. 
not God's word, because the real meaning of humility is saying, I'm not going to put myself first at all with other people and certainly not with God. You see, John the baptizer knew that he had to become smaller as Jesus began his ministry. And Peter and John, they also understood later in this chapter when Jesus took them to Mount Hermon and they saw the reality of who Jesus is in his glory and not only that but Elijah and Moses were there. Um, could I say that they were two witnesses? So preacher what are we supposed to do with this information? Well, that's what this sermon was about. Three things we're supposed to do. First, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you have to deny yourself. Now, what does that word mean? Aparnesasto is the word deny yourself, deny himself. It means to utterly deny, to refuse, to reject. Well, that's a pretty extreme thing to say. Well, do you realize that in the Old Testament there's this thing that's called the vow of the Nazarite? Uh, you can read about it in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. Judges chapter 13, verses 5 through 7. And chapter 16, verse 17. And then you can go to Amos chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And all of them are referring to what the vow of the Nazarite is. Now, remember, we're saying Nazarite not Nazarene. Jesus was a Nazarene, which means he was from Nazareth. But it doesn't mean that he had taken the vow to be a Nazarite. In fact, the Bible doesn't indicate that anywhere. The vow of the Nazarite was performed for any period of time, although in the Mishnah it suggests a period of 30 days, a month. Now, God's law permitted both men and women to take this pledge of dedication. And what was the pledge? Well, you couldn't eat or drink anything that was made from grapes. You were to abstain from alcohol, fermented beverages. You could not remove hair from yourself. In other words, you couldn't get a haircut. You had to let it grow. And you couldn't be near anything dead, a person or an animal. You see, in the Old Testament, the act of denying yourself was limited. But Jesus' command is for utter self-denial for the rest of your life. There are things as a Christian you must always do. And you see, that's what caused problems for Jesus because he was so extreme. But folks, God is extreme. He's extremely holy. And that is what he expects from those that are called to follow in his son's name. All right, so deny yourself. That was part one. There was a second thing, and he said, daily take up your cross. Well, the word for daily is kathamaran, and it means day by day or every day. 
Arato means to carry, to take up, or to take away, or to lift. Now what I find interesting is when you start really looking into this word, the idea of carry is often used with the term baggage. Let me ask you this morning, is the cross part of your baggage? Now everybody carries baggage with them. And a lot of it's not good. You know, bad experiences, failed marriages, um, conduct unbecoming. But the baggage that a Christian is supposed to take with them is the cross. What does that mean? Well, that brings us to the other uh, couple of words. The cross, the word is staron, and it means stake, a stake in the ground, a piece of wood stuck in the ground. What's interesting is that the idea of the cross being a T, T-shaped, as far as we can tell, Roman crosses, they did have a beam that your arms would be attached to. But exactly whether they looked like what we think they look like is, is hard to say. But what is interesting is that the tau, T-A-U, the letter T, had followers in pagan religion, and the pagan religion was the worship of Tammuz, which is mentioned in the Old Testament. And a lot of followers of Tammuz had these crosses. Now, that's not the cross Jesus was referring to. He was referring to dying to yourself, which goes back to deny yourself you have to say Lord if you don't want me to do this or that I won't do it your will has to die what did Jesus say in the garden not my will but thy will be done that's what we have to do and that requires putting your will on a cross. And by the way, there is one other word that Jesus uses here in identifying the cross. He says, Autu, your own cross. Not somebody else's cross. You know, we get so, I don't know, nosy about what somebody else is doing. Uh, we get to thinking about, uh, well, that person's doing this. Maybe I should be doing this. Uh, God wants us to do what he wants us to do, not what somebody else is doing. And then the last part the, that we must do, not only must we deny ourselves, not only must we daily take up our own cross, but we must follow him. Each time Jesus says, let him do this, let him do this, let him do this, that word let implies that we have to choose to do that. But if we are going to be his disciple, if we are going to follow him, these are things, three things we must do. And to follow me is akulotheto. Now this word does mean follow, but it has an implication with it. It that there is a companion we are going with somebody. We are going the same way that that person is going, 
and it implies a union with that person and a likeness to them. Do you look like Jesus? I don't mean physically. But the way that you conduct yourself, is it like Jesus? I know we fail. I know we fail a lot. But do you want to look like him? This term for follow me is used 77 times. Isn't that interesting? 7-7. Seven, seven. 77 times in the Gospels regarding following Christ. Well, let me wrap this up with verses 24 to 26 in Luke chapter 9. Jesus goes on to say, For whoever may desire to save his life shall lose it. But whoever may lose his life on account of me, he shall save it. For what is a man profited, having gained the whole world, but having destroyed himself, or suffered the loss of it? For whoever may have been ashamed of me in my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in the glory of himself and of the Father and of the holy angels. Christian, if you give up your life, in other words, you deny your right to call the shots in your life, then you have his salvation. But those last words in verse 26 should haunt some people. If you are ashamed of He's ashamed of you. And in the book of Daniel, it talks about the resurrection that will happen at the end. Some will be resurrected to glory, and others will be resurrected to everlasting shame. I know some preachers have said uh, that... Uh, that they think that um, people can be ashamed of Jesus' words and still be a Christian. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. But I can tell you one thing. If you do not believe the words of Jesus are true, you're lost. Whether you go to church or not, you're lost because Jesus is the truth. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us to remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9. We ask that you would help us to remember everything that he said and help us to remember to stay in your word for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.